Good evening. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew uh, chapter 8. We're picking up in the Gospel of Matthew, and you're going to say, what do you mean we're picking up in the Gospel of Matthew? We were just in Isaiah in December for Advent. Well, before Isaiah, we were in the Gospel of Matthew, and so our plan is to preach through the entire book, but we understand that the average American attention span is getting shorter by the day, so we break it up in these sort of mini segments. And the reality is, if you want to read Matthew, you probably should read Isaiah too, because Isaiah is all over Matthew, and we find that again in this passage this week. So we're in Matthew chapter 8. Um, uh, the title of the message is A Leper, a Gentile, and a Mother-in-Law, which sounds like a good intro to a joke, but I've been, pro- I've been told I cannot do any mother-in-law jokes because my wife's mother-in-law is in the room. So no mother-in-law jokes. You're welcome. Uh, But just to kind of bring us back up to speed, the beginning of of Matthew tells us uh, about the genealogy of Jesus. Uh, All of these sermons are actually online at our website at redemptionheights.com. You can even sort them by um, book of the Bible or by sermon series, and you can go back and watch them or listen to them if you want at some time. Uh, But we see that Jesus is uh, born, and he's the promise that we've waited for, that this prophecy that's been told to the people of God has finally come to bear in the person of Jesus. And, we, and he starts his ministry, and toward the beginning of his ministry, he preaches what we call the greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And at the end of that sermon, uh, it says this in Matthew seven twenty eight. it says, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. He was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. He was they were astonished at his teaching. He had he had spoken with such authority that it amazed these people. And this word uh, astonished comes up all through the ministry of Jesus, um, this amazing teaching ministry. But it's one thing to be a captivating speaker or an authoritative teacher. It's another thing to be able to back up what you say. Uh, so I, I like music uh, because my dad uh, made me like music. So there was a rule in my house that you will play a sport and an instrument, whether you're good at it or not, you're going to do it because this is what makes a good uh, human being, apparently. And so I'm grateful because it was the guitar that I think gave my wife the first inclination to listen to me. I don't know. She saw me playing and was like, oh, my, dreamy. Uh, I don't think that's what happened at all. Um, But, you know, some of us need all the help we can get. But I like to play the guitar. Uh, I kind of like playing the piano more these days. But uh, I went through a a real guitar phase. And then as I got older, I I sort of came across the electric guitar. I'd grown up playing an acoustic guitar. And with the electric guitar... There's these things that people will buy to change the sound and the tone of their guitar. They're called guitar pedals. Uh, and they, they put them on a little board on the ground. I don't know if you've ever seen this. They're like little, little stomp boxes. If you ever watch someone who has a lot of these pedals, it looks like they're kind of tap dancing while they're playing the guitar. You know, they're, they're uh, making echoes and delays and distortions and, and fuzz and all that sort of stuff. And so there are these little forums online that for a while I would watch, and these guys would spend literally thousands of dollars on guitar pedals, uh, and I, I may or may not be one of those guys who spends all this money on guitar pedals. We will neither confirm nor deny that. But they'll spend all this money, and they'll take pictures of their pedal boards, uh, and then you'll, you'll, every now and then you'll catch a glimpse of one of them playing. You'll find a recording of them, maybe at a church service or something, and you're going, wow, that was underwhelming, right? You had all this money spent, and you talk a big game, you talk about all this gear, you talk about all these guitars, and it doesn't look like it's really, you're really that good of a guitar player. I mean, there are guitars that are worth thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that people will buy just to stand up on stage and strum. And then I went, so I, at the last church I was at, we had this guy who played the guitar at this church. His name was Bobby. Uh, And if you met Bobby, um, Bobby kind of grew up playing in jam bands and things like that out in L.A. and stuff. And and then he got radically saved in his 40s. And and he thought he had to give up music uh, because he didn't know any better because the church he was at had seemed that way. So he cut off his ponytail. 
uh, and was about to sell his guitar, and then he went into this church and saw that they had a guitar player, and he's like, oh, I can do this for Jesus. And Bobby, if you saw him, he hangs drywall for a living. Uh, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go like, oh, man, this guy's a rock star. And he comes up with just one guitar, no pedals, one amplifier, plugs in, and then, man, you just watch this guy go. It's like a work of art. I mean, it's like just... I mean, he, he does the, he, he can make sounds out of that guitar with no additional pedals or anything that most people would just couldn't even dream of. There's a big difference between talking a big game and being able to walk the walk. A lot of times we like, we like to talk it, you know, talk like we can do all sorts of things, like, like we're, uh, we're more impressive than we are. It makes us feel better about ourselves. But when it comes to actually demonstrating a lifestyle that matches up to what we're saying, it doesn't line up. And favorite stories to tell is a story that we're going to uh, hear in a few weeks, and that's Jesus calming the wind and the waves. One of the, I, I'm going to repeat it, I'm sure, in a few weeks, or whoever teaches it, I'm not sure if it's me or James. Uh, but one of the points that we make in that story is this. Jesus doesn't stand in front of the boat and say, God, would you please stop the wind and the waves? He speaks directly to the wind and the waves as the creator of the wind and the waves. So these miracles are evidence of his divine authority. Secondly, they are, they validate, they are validation of his messianic identity. So if you were to go to the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that it's a shorter book, but it spends, it tells these miracles in a longer form. Mark's kind of just amazed at the miracles. He's just like, well, this is crazy. And he just watched them. Matthew, though, we see, shortens these miracles because he has a point in telling us these miracles. He's not just telling them just so we would be amazed. We should be amazed. He's telling them because he's proving that Jesus is who he said he would be. He is the promised Messiah. He is the one come to save. He is the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah like we preached uh, uh, over the Christmas season. In fact, at the end of this passage today, we will see that Jesus' miracles fulfill the promises of Isaiah. Third, these miracles are a glimpse into his future glory. See, we walk around in a broken world. We see brokenness. We see despair. We see disease. These miracles for a moment remind us that that's not the way God created or wants it to be, that he is coming back to redeem and fix. And so for a moment, we see him exercising his authority in the created world so that we can understand what our future will be like. A place of peace with no more tears where all the wrong is made right, all the lies have come undone and now we can live in God's perfect creation. Fourth, which which we'll see a lot tonight, is these miracles are proof of Jesus' compassionate character. Just think about it for a second. Jesus does not have to heal anybody. He does not have to save anybody. The fact that he intervenes at all is an act of grace and compassion. It's a picture of our very salvation, that God is not only powerful, but he is good and kind, that he wants to heal us, that he wants to save us, that he wants to give us life and peace. And lastly, These miracles don't just exist for us to look at and be like, well, that's amazing. They are a call to discipleship. They are a call for us to follow Jesus. They don't just exist for us to gawk at. They are not an end in and of themselves. They are a call for us to see Jesus for who he is and to follow him. We are called to love the giver more than the gift. These miracles actually are intended to get your attention. In fact, that's why I think miracles only happen rarely. They're supposed to break us out of sort of the normal. If if something happens all the time, it is by definition not a miracle. Then it's just normal. So God breaks into our normal and causes us to see, to pay attention The question is, will we pay attention? Imagine that you're driving down a dark country road and you see in the the distance um, some barricades and some lights flashing. It says, road closed. The purpose of those flashing lights 
are to get your attention. Now, if you ignore those flashing lights and ignore that sign, and you just keep driving, uh, it's going to be a problem for you. Jesus is trying to get our attention. We don't just keep going. We stop. We pay attention. We adjust our behavior to what we see in front of us. So here tonight, here's what we're going to see. We're going to see that these miracles tonight show us Jesus' divine authority and his messianic identity. And that he displays them through miraculous acts of compassion. Jesus' divine authority and messianic identity are displayed through miraculous acts of compassion. Look in uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to read the first 17 verses. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness." In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, think deeply about your word here, would you reveal to us just how powerful and beautiful and kind Jesus is? God, would we see clearly your authority and would we respond obediently to your call to follow? Open our eyes to see. Help our hearts to believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first thing we see is this interaction with the leper where Jesus cleanses the outcast. It says that he comes down from the mountain. He'd just been teaching. Uh, This is where the Sermon on the Mount occurred. He comes down. All these people are following him. And this leper, in a sort of an act of boldness, enters into this crowd, kneels before Jesus, and says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. See, leprosy is a, is a real problem. It's a real problem just generally, but it's especially a problem in the Bible. It's a physical problem. Uh, leprosy uh, is sort of, in the Bible, it can, it can stand for all sorts of skin diseases, but it's a disfiguring problem. It's highly contagious. Uh, elsewhere in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, it describes lepers as essentially uh, the living dead. You know, once you get this disease, you, your life is over. And because you're contagious, you have to leave the community and you have to sort of fend for yourself as an outcast. No one wants to be near you because they're afraid of getting sick. And so it, it not only has this physical problem, but it results in this social problem. These are, these are outcast people. These are forgotten people. They're marginalized. They are, they're, they're the unclean, literally. Uh, and so they're left to, to deal with it on their own. Uh, but there's this other picture of leprosy. It's a picture of a spiritual problem. A lot of people at the time assumed that people who got leprosy must be sinners, but more than that, it's a picture of our sin. You know, these people didn't necessarily choose leprosy, but they're lepers nonetheless. They they receive this this disease, and they can't do anything to heal themselves. They're, They're unclean, they're excluded from the community, there's nothing to be done to fix it. And so for this leper to walk up to Jesus 
shows that he recognizes something about Jesus. He sees a power and authority, and he's desperate enough to actually go and ask for help. See, sometimes uh, we have to, actually often, we have to hit rock bottom before we're willing to ask for help. It's sort of a truism of recovery programs. That until you've kind of hit the bottom and are willing to receive help, you're not going to. A leper is at the bottom. There's nowhere else they can turn. So when they hear this authoritative preacher... When, they see, when he sees Jesus, he's like, this is my chance. I have to go. Sometimes, sometimes simple faith, maybe often, maybe even the way God designed it, simple faith has an advantage to seeing and believing Jesus. So we're not supposed to have childish faith, but we are supposed to have faith like a child that trusts that believes, that sees this leopard, this leopard, I guess he lives in the jungle now, this leper, totally different thing that changes the sermon. Uh, Yeah, his spots are washed away, right? Uh, This leper sees Jesus, knows who he is, and listen to what he calls him. He says, Lord, which could just be sort of a, a sign of respect, you know, by saying like, sir, but he says, Lord, and then he bows down, he kneels before him. It's actually a word of worship. So when he calls him Lord and he bows down to worship, he's identifying Jesus as this powerful God become flesh. Now he might not understand all the details of that. It's a little unclear as to what he knows and what he doesn't know. But in his simple faith, he understands that Jesus is Lord. You know, I sometimes wonder, why is Jesus in the Gospels so readily accepted by sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes? Why is he so readily accepted by the outcasts like lepers? He's not accepted by the people who are reading the Bible, the, the, the Hebrew Bible. He's not easily understood by them. They, they actually are, are skeptical of him. It, it, it seems that this goes along with God's plan for salvation. God comes to us in our weakness. Weakness is fertile ground for faith. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. He said, but but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Listen to this. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God not only works in spite of your weaknesses, God chooses to work through your weaknesses. There's actually no other way for God to work other than through human weakness. He's not waiting for you to get it all together. He's not waiting for you to be smart enough, articulate enough. Uh, He's not waiting for you to be bold enough or confident enough. He has chosen to use your weakness to demonstrate his strength. And the leper recognizes that. He says, you can make me clean. He doesn't say, what must I do to be made clean? He says, you can make me clean. He's too weak to clean himself. He's completely vulnerable. He has no social religious protection. He has no money to offer Jesus. He can't say, okay, Jesus, if you clean me, then I'll help you out. He has nothing. When he comes to Jesus, he has only need. He has nothing to give Jesus but need. He needs something from Jesus. And it's precisely his nothing that Jesus wants. Jesus wants you. He wants the nothing that you have to offer because he loves you. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need you to clean yourself up. He doesn't need your talents or your skills, but he loves you and he wants you. See, all of us, like the leper, are vulnerable. We're helpless. 
Sin has corrupted our souls, and we don't have anything good to bring to Jesus. We can try to play the religious game. We can try to, to pretend like we have some things together, but we have nothing to offer Jesus, and that's what he wants. See, the first step in salvation is admitting your sin and bringing your nothing and laying it at his feet. Some people, maybe you, aren't able to draw near to Jesus because you think you're too good, or at least you're good enough. But the leper knows he is nothing. But there still seems to be a, a picture of doubt in his mind. He says, Lord, you can make me clean. But what does he say in the middle? Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. It's almost like he believes in his power, but he doubts his compassion. Which makes a lot of sense. He's a leper. He's never seen compassion. No one has ever, no one has ever come to help him. No one has, has come to sit with him. No one has touched him or hugged him. The religious community has isolated him. He's outside the walls of the city. He's living on his own. He has no help. So he understands the difference between power and compassion. And here's the beauty of it. Jesus is able and willing to heal him. And look at how he does it. It says, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. There's actually sort of an intensification there. Not only did he touch him, he stretched out his hand and touched him. Jesus touched this man and cleaned, and he was made clean. He healed him. Uh, just the idea of someone touching a leper was so gross to the people of that time. No one can even imagine that. I wonder what this leper even thought in that moment. You know, you know the power of how, what the power of touch has for someone who hasn't received it? You know, we, we've seen stories of children who grow up in orphanages uh, in, in, uh, in all over the world where uh, there's just so many orphans that they can't care for that these children are put in uh, cribs essentially all day. They're taken out to be changed. They eat in their crib. They, they sleep in their crib. They play in their crib. Uh, no, no one's rocking them. No one's hugging them. And in fact, uh, they found that children who are born addicted uh, to uh, some sort of illicit drug, uh, one of the things that helps them recover quickly is just being held by a human being. That, that when, when they have regular contact with a human being, uh, with, a, with a, someone who cares them affection, uh, they, they recover uh, they detox quicker, but when they don't have that, they, it takes them two, three times, four times longer. This is like, these are demonstrable studies on this, like scientific studies. But these, these children that grow up in orphanages with no touch, uh, no uh, human contact, no love and affection, they actually develop this thing called reactive attachment disorder that when they get adopted, um, the people who actually want to show them affection, they push them away because they don't understand what it's like to be to be. Uh, touched. I mean, just imagine Jesus healing this man with a touch. You know, I think this extends to the way we even do ministry. You know, we can't, we can't do ministry that's disconnected from the messiness and even maybe the grossness of people's lives. Um, there are people that you meet that, you know, your first in instinct is to sort of like take a step away. Those are the kind of people that Jesus took a step toward. And there's, there's a healing power in a godly touch. And I remember there was, a, there was a particularly difficult season of ministry and life for our family uh, many years ago. Um, just a lot of things had sort of come together to be very, very, very difficult uh, personally and, and in ministry. And, and we were at a, I was at an elder meeting with, our, with our, the elders of the church I was at. And it was a very, very difficult elder meeting because we had a lot of difficult decisions to make in our church. And in the middle of that, that meeting, um, just sort of, I, I don't know if you think pastors are perfect because we're definitely not, uh, just tempers boiled over, let's say. Uh, and, and what came out in that meeting was that a lot of us were struggling with really difficult things, and I sort of shared out of frustration that my personal life was very difficult, and, and I didn't feel like, like anyone had, sh had cared about that. And there's this one elder, he's, he's probably, I don't know, in his late 60s, big, tall, tall guy, uh, uh, you know, like, Six five, I don't know how tall he is, something like that. And, and I just remember him coming over 
in kind of like a, a fatherly moment, just, just grabbed me, hugged me, just pulled me real close to his chest. You know, I'm, I'm not a tall guy. I just remember my head kind of going right in his chest, and he just prayed for me. And it's one thing to pray for someone. It's another thing to hug someone. But in that moment where his spiritual care and his physical touch came, uh, there was just such a healing to that. And I can, I can imagine that Jesus, you know, I, I can't go out there and heal someone's disease with, with a touch. Uh, I've, I've never had that gift. Uh, if I did, I think the hospitals would like me to come by. don't have that. But I know that I can come to people and rather than walk away, rather than distance myself, I can draw near and I can show them the love of Jesus through a handshake, through a high five, through a hug. Jesus healed this man with a touch. And then he says, he says one of the most bizarre things that happens all through uh, the Gospels. He says, don't tell anyone. Right? He says, don't tell anyone, go show the priest. He's wanting to make sure that this man's healing is validated appropriately. But also, Jesus isn't interested in, in just gathering a crowd that wants to see a bunch of miracles. Uh, they don't, he doesn't need to, to show off uh, and have like a little magic show. I know this is hard for us to imagine in our Instagram world where it doesn't count unless it's on social media. Like, if you don't post it, it's like it didn't even really happen. We can't imagine not telling uh, any, we, can, we can't imagine not telling everyone the smallest things. If we did something like this, we would be letting everyone know. But Jesus is not interested in popular appeal. He's interested in demonstrating compassion to this leper. He goes on, so that's, that's kind of miracle number one in this little section. He goes on, and we see that he not only uh, cleanses he not only cleanses this leper, this outcast, he welcomes an outsider in verses 5 through 13. It tells us that the next, uh, when he enters this city of Capernaum, a centurion comes forward. So a centurion is not an Israelite. This is a, a Roman uh, military man, a commander of it. The word centurion kind of sounds like century. Uh, it comes from the command of at least 100 people, but the, the numbers kind of get uh, shifted uh, through history. He might have 200 or even up to 1,000 people under his command. This is kind of an officer in the military. This is somebody. He's important. He's responsible for training and disciplining a unit. Uh, these centurions in the ancient world had a reputation for being men of harsh discipline. He was important. And he comes to Jesus and tells him of his servant who's paralyzed and suffering. And so Jesus, in his compassion, says, I'll come heal him. And the centurion says something amazing. Look at, look at uh, verse 8. He says, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. And he goes on to say, look, I, I, I'm a man under authority. He has commanders over him. And I, I'm in command of a lot of people. I recognize authority. What he's saying is this. I recognize who you are, Jesus, as a man of authority. I recognize your power. See, the leper recognized Jesus' power because of his weakness. The centurion recognizes Jesus' power because of his relative strength. He's saying, look, if I'm important, then Jesus must really be somebody. I, I don't know if, you've, uh, if you like watching the Winter Olympics, but one of the, the most confounding sports in the Winter Olympics to me is figure skating. Uh, I don't understand any sort of athletic endeavor that is impossible to do, that is judged subjectively, and requires you to like have like presentation and, and like, uh, you know, makeup and... and costumes and all that kind of stuff like like if you go out there with an ugly costume but are the best skater do you still win or do you lose i don't understand any of that right uh but then when you're watching these uh these figure skaters skate and you'll see the scores and there will be like well that's a tenth point deduction oh that's a two tenths point deduction you'll hear the commentator say this i'm like what are they watching I have no idea. That person just did like a, a spinny triple thing and like I would give them all the points. Like here, have all the points. I don't know how you do that. You're, you're skating on knives. I don't understand any of this. But see, I'm not a figure skater, if you couldn't tell. Uh, I don't recognize the unique differences. I don't know when, when a leg is pointed slightly off or when you're going too fast through a turn. I mean, sometimes they'll say, oh, they didn't finish half that turn. I'm like, I, maybe I can't count either because I, I couldn't even count all the turns in that. You know what I mean? 
But when there's someone who is trained in that, who understands that, they see every little detail. They notice all the nuances uh, between uh, little turns of the foot and, and uh, little flourishes of the hand and, and everything. They, they just know it because they're experts in this. This man is like that. He's an expert in authority. And so he recognizes authority in Jesus because that's his expertise. He knows what to look for. And he recognizes when something is worthy. And what he knows is that he, this relatively powerful man, is not worthy to have Jesus even come under his roof. I mean, just think about that. He comes with boldness to ask for Jesus to heal him, even though he knows he's not even worthy to have him come under his roof. That Jesus must only say a word. Because the God who spoke all of creation into existence can perform a miracle with just a word. See, this isn't like some sort of uh, good versus evil moment. That's not what miracles are. You know, I, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Um, you know, our men's Bible study, we worked hard the other night and went and saw Star Wars because um, that's how you do it. But I love Star Wars, but, but sometimes I think we, we sort of imbibe this Star Wars view of the world, which is just dualism. That there's like good and evil, like yin and yang, and they're in this perfect balance, and like uh, in the right moments, it's kind of a little give and a little take and a little give and a little take. That's not what's going on with Jesus. That's not God. God is in supreme control. He has absolute authority. There is no evil that can even touch the will of God. He's not asking permission. He's not saying abracadabra. He doesn't have his Harry Potter wand to make this one miracle work, and then he has to recharge his magical batteries. He is God. With a word, he can change everything. And this man recognizes that. He recognizes his unworthiness, but that doesn't stop him from seeking Jesus. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of discipleship, that we should recognize our unworthiness. We should be humble in our approach to God, but we should still be bold and have faith. In fact, the more unworthy we see ourselves, the more bold our faith should be in God. Weakness not only illuminates the need for strength, it paves the way for strength to be magnified. When I am weak, I am strong. Do you feel unworthy? Do you feel broken? Do you feel helpless? Do you feel weak? Good. Come to Jesus. Human weakness is not a feature of, it's not a bug, it's a feature. It's what God wants to use to show his strength. And I love this centurion's sincere request. He's not coming because he needs, uh, he needs a bigger house. He's not coming because he has a personal need. He's coming because he has a servant who's sick. He's coming on behalf of another. And Jesus, this is crazy, it says, is amazed by his faith. Verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. See, the miracle actually in this passage is not Jesus healing his servant, it's the faith of the centurion. Typically, the crowds are amazed at Jesus, but here, the faith of the centurion amazes Jesus. The miracle was that this man would see and believe in Jesus. A man of authority would humble himself. A Gentile would place his trust in a Jewish Messiah. The miracle is the centurion's faith. See, the greatest miracle is not healing a physical disease. The greatest miracle is the unbeliever placing their trust in Jesus. See, if you're a Christian, you can't ever say you've never experienced a miracle. You are a miracle. And the kingdom of God is filled with those who would show such unexpected faith. So it's a very scary section that comes next at the end of verse 10. 
Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the promise was for the blessing of all people. And a lot of the Israelites of Jesus' time were relying on their ancestry, their ethnicity, their religious heritage, and they misunderstood that the promise of God was always received by faith. That you weren't born into salvation. That your parents' salvation didn't save you. Your faith in the Son of God saved you. So here the Gentile, the outsider, is welcomed into the kingdom. He has a seat at the table, and it says many sons of the kingdom are excluded. They're thrown into outer darkness. See, the centurion is not just eating the crumbs or the leftovers. He's seated at God's table. God treats him like a son when those who are the sons are cast out. Your knowledge won't save you. Your parents won't save you. Your good behavior won't save you. Your superstitions won't save you. Your church membership won't save you. Your good intentions, your New Year's resolutions, your charitable donations, none of them will save you. Faith in the Son of God saves you. And the centurion knew it, and so many of those who had the advantages of being Israelites missed it. The borders of God's kingdom are open from east to west, and everyone's invited to sit at the table and eat, but there's only one key, there's only one path, there's only one way, and his name is Jesus. Jesus cleanses the unclean, he welcomes the outsider. And then we see here he comes to the week. In verse 14, it says, When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. It's probably important to the disciples when you know, Peter's wife's mom gets healed. It's a big deal for them to notice. That's probably why they pass it on. But I love just the picture of this. See, the, limp, the leper came to Jesus. Remember, uh, waded into the crowd, found him when he was coming down the mountain. The centurion came to Jesus. Here, Jesus comes to the woman. He goes into her house. He goes where she, she can't even get up. She's too weak to leave her bed. So he comes to her. That's a picture of salvation. We didn't sort of work our way up to heaven. God came down to earth. You know the movie Hitch with uh, Will Smith and uh, Kevin James, right? He's teaching him how to kiss. Remember that scene? Ben, you want to demonstrate with me? I'll be Will. I'm just kidding. Uh, right, he tells him, when you kiss, you go 90, or she, she goes 90, you go 10? No, you go 90, she goes 10? I don't remember. It's 90 and 10. I think it's you go 90, she goes 10. That's not what salvation is. See, a lot of us treat it that way. Like, God, God really came really, really far. And then I kind of like mustered up the faith to... No, no, God came the whole way. You were on your deathbed. You know, Ephesians 2 tells us we were dead in our trespasses and sin, and God made us alive. I don't know any dead people that sort of contribute to their own life. God can go anywhere he wants, and he comes to the bedridden, the needy, the sick, the weak, and he saves them. And immediately she got up to serve him. She didn't have to go get some Pedialyte or some Gatorade. Immediately she starts to serve him. Right, I love this. She's saved and she's serving. We're mended to be on a mission. Our salvation always leads to us uh, serving the Lord. Jesus' divine authority and messianic identity is displayed through each one of these miraculous acts and each one of them demonstrates his compassion, that he would touch the leper, that he would welcome the outsider, that he would go to the bedside of the sick. And all of this proves... As verse 17 says, it fulfills what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. It's a quote from Isaiah chapter 53, a passage of scripture we should all meditate on regularly. That the suffering servant, the divine son of God, the Emmanuel God uh, become flesh, takes on our sin. He bears it on himself. Jesus here shows every bit of his character. He has authority. He, he, ha, he can speak with just a word and heal them. And he has compassion. He, he touches the leper. He comes to the bedside of the woman. He's merciful. He's mighty. He's miraculous and he's compassionate. He's not weak in his compassion, but he's not aloof in his power. 
and he proves to be who God promised he would be. That this, this Savior would come to take the sins of his people. See, when we see Jesus, we're getting a full understanding of what was promised to us in the, in the Old Testament. A lot of times when we hear, the, even the word old in Old Testament, kind of makes you think like, like, I just want the New Testament. New sounds better. I don't want old. That's why a lot of times you'll hear me say Hebrew Bible, because I feel like it's not as pejorative as Old Testament. You know, when we say Old Testament, we're, we're not saying it's lesser, right? It is, the, it is God's Word. It is Scripture. It is the, the promise of God to us. What we're saying is it's a former. And, and so I like to think of the Old Testament as like, have you ever seen the back of a really beautiful tapestry? Sometime, just look up a picture of a tapestry and, and look up the back side of a tapestry. If you turn a tapestry over, you know, this, this uh, beautifully um, woven tapestry, and you look at the back side of it, it's like, it's just a mess of like strings and strands because you're like, what? Because it's all the back side, but then you flip it over, and it's this beautiful picture. I think the Old Testament is kind of like that sometimes. It's like this mosaic of promises and pictures and stories and narratives and and sometimes it can seem like a little bit of a a mess because we haven't flipped it over to understand what picture it's making the new testament is like flipping the tapestry over and we see that jesus is the picture right all the promises are, are painting this beautiful picture of jesus he is who god has promised to save us He's the lens that helps us understand all the promises of God. He doesn't remove or destroy the promises of the Old Testament. He fulfills them and reveals their true shape and meaning. And so so I want to ask this question. What exactly are Isaiah and Matthew trying to tell us about the salvation of Jesus? What exactly did he bear? What exactly did he carry? What What did he come to bring? See, some people have taken this statement, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases, to mean that God would never allow you to be sick. Never allow you to suffer. If you suffer or are sick, then you lack faith and you don't trust God enough. And if you would just believe more and, and believe, I don't know, faith harder. Is that a thing? We're going to make sure that says faith harder. Uh, I don't know. You, you just kind of conjure up some more belief, then it'll all go away. And like any good lie, there's enough truth to be believable in that. See, God can miraculously heal. God does have authority over every disease, and ultimately in heaven there will be no more sickness, pain, disease, or death. He will take all of our suffering in his time, but for now, suffering has a purpose. Philippians 1.29, Paul says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Colossians 1 says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings. Wow. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Philippians 3.10 says, Paul prays that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. To follow Christ is to be like him. It is not to be healthy and wealthy. It is to suffer for his glory. Our current suffering is a reminder that God has promised something eternally better. These miracles in Matthew remind us that something better is coming. But the core of our problem is not sickness or poverty. That is a symptom of the problem. The core of our problem is sin. And Jesus didn't come to put a band-aid on the cancer of our sin with a few cosmetic miracles. He came to bear our sins, to reunite us with God, to offer us eternal life and eternal joy. He saved us with the sacrifice of his own body. He bore our sins. He took them on ourselves. He took our punishment. He paid the debt we couldn't pay. He gives us life that we couldn't acquire on our own. See, the powerful miracle worker is the sacrificial lamb that came to bear your sins. And we live in a broken world and we long for a a word of hope to break through. And Jesus is coming to break through our stress and our fear and our comfort and our boredom. Jesus is the word that has come to break through into your life to show you that he is the miraculous, compassionate God. He comes with authority and he comes with love. He comes to the outsider, the unclean, and the weak. 
kind of reminds me of the story that I've shared before in our congregation, but I'll share it again because I'm sure not all of us have heard it, the story of uh, Father Damien. He was a, a Dutch uh, priest, and he went to Hawaii in, in uh, 1864. And you're like, well, that seems like a pretty cool gig. I wouldn't mind being stationed in Hawaii. Uh, but he went to Hawaii uh, at the time that it was relatively uh, sort of, uh, a lot of outsiders had come in recently, and they brought a lot of diseases. And one of the diseases they brought was called Hansen's disease, which is sort of the modern version of leprosy. Uh, it's probably actually a little bit worse than some of the ancient versions of leprosy, um, as those could kind of span the gamut. And so this disease, this disease of Hansen's disease, was highly contagious and completely untreatable till 1930. The infected had no hope. Leprosy caused de- degeneration of the skin, eyes, and limbs. It disfigured its victims. Sufferers were seen as outcast and isolated from the rest of the community. And so in Hawaii, because this happened, because this disease was spreading, the government, the authorities, quarantined lepers to a small island called Molokai. About 800 or so people were sent there, all lepers. And once the lepers were out of sight, no longer a threat to the general population, uh, government support started to to wane. Food got more and more scarce. Health care became harder to come by. And so this community of basically diseased people who only who were all just slowly marching to their death were taking care of themselves so poverty uh, alcoholism depression all of that reigned and so damien asked for permission and received permission to go to molokai to serve these lepers and he pledged to be a father to them who loves you so much that he does not hesitate to become one of you to live and die with you He knew working in the disease-ridden colony virtually guaranteed that he would become infected too. His superiors had given him strict advice. Do not touch them. Do not allow them to touch you. Do not eat with them. But Damien made the decision to transcend his fear. He committed to visit every leper on the island to ask about their needs. He washed their bodies and bandaged their wounds. What surprised the lepers most was that Damien touched them. See, doctors shrank from the lepers. In fact, the one story tells of a local doctor who only changed bandages with a cane for fear of getting infected. But Damien not only touched the lepers, he hugged them. He dined with them. The moment finally arrived in December of 1884 when Damien himself contracted leprosy. He wrote home to his brother, I make myself a leper with the lepers to gain all to Jesus Christ. Even before... Uh, Even before contracting the disease, Damien spoke of himself and the people of Molokai as we lepers. He identified closely with those he came to serve, and thus, before and after the disease, he offered a powerful, concrete expression of God's love. He bore their illness, and he carried their disease. What a picture of what Jesus has done for us. That he comes close to us and he bears our sin. The sinless one takes on our sin so that we can have the righteousness of God. Jesus has taken on flesh to bear your sin. Will you place your faith in him? Will you give him everything? Will you fully and completely submit yourself to his strong and tender care? He offers that invitation to you as he did the leper, as he did the centurion, And as he did this woman who was sick in her bed, he has come to give you life if you had placed your faith in him.